Hello? Yes, perfect. Okay. And now for something completely different. Um, <laughs> I know that we're billed for like 45 minutes, but my sets usually don't run that long, so hopefully we can get you to lunch um, pretty sharp. But we are Matchbox, Sunny, and we are going to be presenting on collaborative potential from archives to audiences. And so today we thought it would be most useful to run through from our perspective ways in which we as um, independent film programmers currently work with archives and together with yourselves, some points of misconception and areas where we can be really developing those relationships. And we'll be rounding off today with a, discuss a discussion on Sidecard, which is um, a resource that we've developed for access material um, database that we developed in collaboration with the Independent Cinema Office and some of the BFI film hubs uh, regionally within the UK. And we really want this to be a collaborative um, conversation and we're thrilled that there's so many archives with us in the room and online. And we really want to be hearing your input as well in terms of your experiences of working with film programmers and really looking at bringing the resources that you have and the archival potential to more eyes. Um, and I think it's probably important to note that there is a lot that we don't know about archives as um, film programmers and that we're looking to develop um, that insight. And we speak from our own experiences, which are um, specifically as independent exhibitors. So we are not tied to any uh, institution um, or commercial enterprise or even bricks or mortar venue. We're quite nomadic like that. Um, and really today what we're presenting is just a reflection on working together and the ways in which these relationships can develop. So you can see um, some questions there that we would like to prompt for you guys in the room. And just to clarify that we may fall into the language of film, but we mean anything um, that you have within the archives that could be related to moving image or um, even supplementary to that. And I can certainly uh, see myself hitting up the Smithsonian for that Tupperware film later on. Um, yeah, and we have limited knowledge, it's all about exchange, and we're excited to be here. So just a little bit of background, because we know you might not know us. Um, I'm Megan Mitchell, I am the producer of Matchbox Cine. I have a background in um, audience development, specifically for youth audiences, as well as being an access consultant, and despite the accent, a trained audio describer. I'm Sean Welsh, I'm a programmer, producer, and also lead subtitler for Matchbox. Um, so we do, as Megan says, we also do access materials for films, and, and actually not just for films, for films and film-related content, moving image work across the board, and increasingly do access uh, description as well. But we also program uh, f several film festivals and lots of like spin-off and standalone events. Um, that's who I am anyway. Yeah, and together we are Matchbox Cine. Um, our programming arm specialises in celebrating the orphans, outcasts and outliers of cult cinema. Um, our programme is purposefully, almost exclusively repertory uh, that fall within films that you can't see anywhere else. Um, and we're naturally interested in films that fall outside of the cult canon and outside of categorisation. So um, films that seem to have no natural home other than us and archives, I guess. Um, we also, however, deliver non-repertory um, programming because we are not um, serious people. So we run Cagerama, which is Europe's biggest and longest running Nicolas Cage film festival. Um, just because I'm here, I am the world's leading academic on Nicolas Cage's first film. So I'm happy to take questions exclusively on that. And we also run the world's only Keanu Reeves film festival. Um, these are vehicles through which we deliver um, highly accessible film festivals. So within Weird Weekends as well, we also present everything with descriptive subtitles for deaf audiences or anyone that needs them. Um, we are now moving in to deliver everything with audio description. And we also price all of our film screenings on a pay what you can afford sliding scale from three to eight pounds. Um, just to make sure that audiences have that availability and access. And certainly I think when we're talking to your guys about archive work and getting that to audiences, accessibility for us is a large part of that work. 
um, as Sean says, we're also access producers, so we create descriptive subtitles and audio description in-house. We have um, a team for that. We make Matchbox out to be like a conglomerate. There's about me, him, another subtitler, and our access coordinator, Charlie Little. Um, but we do an extensive amount of work when it comes to making films accessible. So over the last couple of years, we've made over, I think, 3,000 films now accessible. Um, and we also advise on access um, for film festivals, productions, distributors, um, the, whole, the whole gambit of it, essentially. Um, and like I say, we're here today to, to discuss the potential collaborative efforts, I think. And there's a lot of work happening within independent film exhibition that I think that we can share and that we can learn from you guys from. So yeah, independent exhibitors and the archives. And I think it's important to start from the beginning where these are um, important for programmers. And we, I think, specifically within our practice, but certainly a lot of our colleagues in the sector, rely on archives when it comes to sourcing and dealing with repertory and weird films. Um, whether that's formal or informal archives. Um, and certainly for us, it's where film history is living at the moment. We are seeing archives as a space where we can draw inspiration, where we can research, and where we can understand more deeply the cinema and the films and the fragments that we're working with. And I think practically archives for us, they offer film materials, supplementary materials, and things which point towards rights holders or better context for films. Um, and a, a broader framework which benefits our practice. And certainly, I think, if you have a little look at our black catalogue, you will understand why it can become quite complex to even work out where a film has come from. And certainly, um, we come from a UK context. However, we work internationally, um, quite a lot of work in the States and some in Europe. And I would say that, especially in a UK context, archives are very underutilised. Within the repertory film programming um, landscape of the UK, it's often repetitive and relying on these cult classics um, or temple restorations for specific large uh, nationwide projects, like the Pill and Pressburger season for the BFI at the moment. Um, and we're still seeing it quite top-down, London-centric, um, although we do have local hubs, which have avowed the aim of decentralising film culture but it does seem to be, um, in some extent, on contradictory terms. With European archives, US archives and World Art archives, they feed into the palette of our programming and the programming of similar independent exhibitors like ourselves. And I think that bringing that uh, collaborative relationship together is just a way to harness that interest that we already have with it. And for us, um, we worked with a variety of archives from Japan, Estonia, America, Wales, uh, including the American Genre Film Archive, who are best buddies, um, Berkeley, the National Film Archive of Japan, Arsenal in Berlin, the Estonian Film Network, um, NFA Here, uh, and Winnipeg Film Group, who, again, if you look at our website, we are weirdly the biggest Winnipeg fans. Um, and we're going to be giving a short case study in a little uh, couple of slides about the work that we have done with the Screen and Sound Archive at the National Library of Wales and a couple of other archives that we've worked with because I think that that's probably the best way to um, exemplify some of the things that we've learned and some of the ways that those relationships have been beneficial. And I think that these archives offer so many wonderful things for programmers. Um, but we would also like to hear from you about your experiences, and especially if they're a little gossipy about other programmers not really, you know, understanding archives, we would love that. Um, because I think overall we can still sometimes see programmers looking to archives as simply outlets or repositories from which we take from. And certainly I think that we need to address uh, the old proverb of, well, it was found in the archives as if it's appeared to a programmer um, without context. And I think it can be difficult as well for programmers to even know where to begin with archives. Certainly we've just turned up in Prague to learn about floppy disks and then ask for your stuff. But if you don't have that um, opportunity, it can be difficult to even work out how to get into those doors and understand as well the context of archives when um, you're meeting with them. 
Yeah, and I think even though we're talking from our um, vantage point as independent programmers who do want things from archives, um, it's important to understand that we also have empathy with archives who are resource and time short. Um, and certainly I think that's a meeting point for independent programmers where we would all understand. But also that there is an opportunity there when you connect with independent programmers to really bring the work that you're doing to wider audiences and certainly within our context that is um, very much access focused as well. And also I think that we're hearing a lot from organized uh, archives who maybe have either institutional support or have their own means of being able to engage with the audiences and public that we're looking at. But I think that there's additional skills and resources that independent exhibitors can bring and also a wider context for archives that are more useful. Um, and so now I'm going to hand over to Sean to give a wee bit of background to some of the archive work. Okay, so to offer some examples of the existing pathways through which programmers and archives are interacting, we're going to highlight a few examples of our own work with archives and archival material over the past few years. Um, and as Megan mentioned, we've got like um, a long history kind of leading up to the more intensive work we've been doing now. Uh, we mentioned the NFA, it was like, I think 2019, we had a, a film in one of our festival programs. Um, does this work better maybe? Um, we had a film in one of our festival programs by, and I'm gonna try to murder the pronunciation, uh, Vera Kitova. Um, I look for some recognition. Um, apologies for having mangled that. Um, but we kind of relied upon them to help us screen it. And originally we couldn't screen it in English because there was no subtitles available. And then uh, that conversation we returned to like a year or more later to find that another exhibitor had made the subtitles and therefore we could. And so that was like one of our earliest conversations with archives that ended up being very fruitful. Um, so. We've worked with a number of archives purely in the sense of granting licenses and materials. That was one case. Um, digital copies of film files mostly, sometimes also subtitles and other deliverables. Uh, and for the most part, this has been a straightforward process. Uh, we find these films through various avenues, usually our own research. We find them listed online in the, the archives website catalog, or occasionally simply we email the National uh, Archive of a particular country uh, and start from there and uh, we find almost uh, almost without fail. Um, the archives are very keen to help us if they can with their first-hand materials or to facilitate communication with whoever may have them, if that's the rights holder or the materials holder or the next most likely person to know about these materials. Um, but the more involved and more beneficial to archive processes, which we'd like to see happening more often with archives and film programmers have been, <coughs> excuse me, We'd like to see those happening and where there's overlap, we need to have more understanding and shared uh, language and just uh, beyond the sharing of the, the resources themselves and more understanding of context. As we said, we're not tied to a national institution or um, a corporate entity and so um, it's, you can, it can, it's appreciable how difficult it might be to uh, understand who we are when we come to someone with a, a request and so Obviously, the more like miles we have on, on the road um, and the more things we have behind us, the easier it is to demonstrate who we are and, and to establish some kind of trust in that relationship. Um, for example, when we spoke to Bamfa first about a film, they were quite quick to trust us. Um, and that's, that's not because they're quick to trust, I, I wouldn't necessarily think, but they were keen to work with us. Um, and we, had, we immediately had some common ground in the project that we wanted to, to get stuck into. Um, so the National Screen and Sound Archive of Wales, um, we saw and were granted funding for a BFI Major Programmes Archive pot, although they didn't want to finance the audio description as the cost per head was too expensive. Um, luckily, that's something that we can, um, in, because we have that facility internally, we can engage with that ourselves and do it in kind. Um, Funding, they funded support of, uh, they, they supported the, the translation of these films because they were in Welsh and hadn't been translated into English and the descriptive subtitles that were the basis of that translation. So the work has now led to our collaboration with a North American uh, release um, at some point um, and additional materials related to those films, uh, uh, like additional content created for contextual purposes and to kind of properly frame these films um, for future audiences. Um, and so, yeah, Bamfa was a really interesting one. We were really keen to, there's a film called, uh, you can see on the screen there, like this is a, well, I'm kind of spoiling the end of this, this particular anecdote. It was a film called Troika, um, Frederick Hobbs considered lost since 1969 or thereabouts. 
And so um, it was one of those ones which you may be familiar with the Lost Media uh, website, which kind of tracks these things. And Troika was one of those ones that was top of our list of films that we were keen to explore. Um, and essentially, we, we realized that, that, that Berkeley held the materials, and then we just went from there in terms of, we did the legwork in terms of finding the, the estate of the filmmaker, because the, the filmmaker had, had died about five years previously. And we just basically did the legwork. Um, the, the archive themselves had the film on their, their top five list of films that they would like to restore, but they didn't have the resources, like um, the, not the, necessarily the technical resources, but the financial resources. So we were able to um, meet them uh, there and then again, do the legwork, the research work to put the, to get the authority to extract the materials from the archive transport them to our uh, colleagues at AGFA, the American Genre Film Archive, who do a lot of work, um, increasingly do a lot of work with restoration and preservation. Um, so, and we had a previous relationship with them working on another film called Crime Wave, a Canadian film from the Winnipeg Film Archive um, by uh, a director called John Pays. And so we had already worked with them to preserve a version of uh, his film Crime Wave. And so, we continued that work in relationship with uh, Troika. Um, so yeah, both of those examples highlight the potential for longer term collaborations between programmers and archives. And I think Troika particularly is a really great example because as I say, Berkeley had it on their list of films they were keen to restore and preserve. Uh, they held the materials, but they were in, um, they, 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 at some point there was some kind of scan that was made of the film just for, for research purposes, Lores, um and actually turned out that the, the some of the reels had been switched, so like the even that digital copy it uh, was was out of order and um as I say, they didn't have necessarily the resources to conduct the restoration, so that was a really um fruitful collaboration in that sense um and uh, interestingly, as I say, from the perspective of um film programmers um the film was considered lost it, it was an i guess of niche appeal to that to that extent um but again, those are the kind of films we specialize in, the films that aren't necessarily going to be picked up by somebody else, but are still um, very exciting and worthwhile, but they don't necessarily have the hook to make them commercially viable. Like they might not be a horror film or a sci-fi film um, or anything that are like, you know, maybe uh, queer focused or, or black focused that are worthwhile um, and necessary preservations and restorations. So these films that we're talking about sometimes all too often fall through the cracks, but in, in actual fact are very much worth preserving and um, to be spread further out and to get, to get new audiences and to kind of, um, to get them screened more and more often. That's kind of what we were about. So um, yeah, so uh, we think it's important to point out it's often we're often reliant on archives having someone or a group within their team who is particularly interested in the project. Um, and it's not because the archive doesn't want the films or the media to reach people or be used, but simply because they're spread too thin. They have too little um, um, of their own resources and they obviously have to um, use that, that. That's a very valuable asset in itself and it has to be used sparingly. Um, there can also be prolonged conversations needed when programmers are asking or attempting to figure out ex uh, ex exhibition specific uh, questions, including who is the rights holder to a film they might have. Um, you, I'm sure you, you, many of you will be, uh, have experience of this. You, you know who's deposited the materials or who's originally shared them, um, but that doesn't necessarily equate to who has the rights to the film. Um, in various contexts, you know, whether it's like, and that itself can be hugely complicated in terms of theatrical rights, rights per territory, uh, rights in perpetuity, all these things can be really complicated. It can be, it, they don't necessarily all sit with the one person. Um, rights, rights can have reverted um, because they can be time-based. And so it's, it can be very thorny and quite often there's no resource to figure that out. So that's something that we can bring to the table to do that legwork as well, as well as the, the interest and the potential of the funding to underwrite it. Um, so yeah, funding and time, particularly to de develop and build those relationships, we think is really important. Um, I'll hand back over to you now. Lecturing. Yeah, and I think within those collaborations, we learned a lot and certainly working with the archive, essentially we took um, these two Welsh films that no one, I think even in Wales, had ever seen, except for having been screened in the 80s to primary school children, and these are horror films. Um, 
to now what is going to be, like Sean says, a North American release with all of the supplementary material that we've produced that essentially offers archival context. And working with um, the Welsh Archive, we were able to access things that would enhance that. So not just digital film files, but also these images and um, everything else to go around it. And so certainly I think for us and as independent exhibitors and speaking from that vantage point within the sector, for us, the better the connection between programmers and archives, the wider awareness of the work that you're doing will produce. Um, and I think the increasing understanding of who within archives is doing what, who's interested in what, um, and what archives have is really important for us. And I think we all understand the increased need to safeguard archives. And I think collaboration between archives and the film sector is a really important way to lobby for more funding and also access funding in different ways. And certainly we were able, um, when it came to Troika, that was a, I'll call it a matchbox private donation. It was our savings, but everything else was um, funding from other avenues that we were able to access as um, exhibitors. And certainly, I think that time is really important, again, as Sean said, that we're able to bring that knowledge and understanding when it comes to accessing licenses, rights, and untangling things that maybe archives wouldn't have the, the, t the time to do. Um... Yeah, and shared resources. So now we're going to go into the big song and dance. Um, so we wanted to present Sidecard as an example of an exhibition created resource which could be enhanced and used by archives, but also maybe make your lives a bit easier. Um, and as well as signposting ways that we can develop accessibility across the sector. Because again, I know we've said it a few times now, but I think for us, access um, in the broadest terms is really what we're trying to achieve. So um, this is Sidecard. You can see a screen grab of the website itself on the right-hand side here. Um, it was developed out of a, a, a missing uh, resource that we found as access practitioners. We see, with, even with an investment or a sincere kind of um, idea about pursuing a, a equal access to, to the arts, particularly moving image and, and film work, um, there is a lot of uh, duplication of work and also uh, not the, the work that was created in making these access materials was one and done because it wasn't shared, it wasn't made available widely um, and people weren't put together to, there was no real way to find out if something was available and who to contact for it. It's essentially what Sidecard is. It lets you uh, research access materials that have been made for a particular film and it also allows you to interrogate that information from a number of different angles, um, including, you can't really see it in the, in the screen grab there, it's a bit too uh, small, but you can filter by uh, duration of film even, uh, by year, um, and by the kind of access material it is, the, the file format, and also the editorial content of, that's on there. So it's actually, um, hopefully the information is interrogable from a, a number of different angles. So if you, essentially, if you, even if you have, as a programmer in a, in a venue or a festival programmer, you, can, you have a slot that's available um, that's 90 minutes, you can find a 90 minute film from 1970 that has descriptive subtitles available. Um, that's a very specific example of, of what you might do with it, but that's just to kind of demonstrate that we wanted to make this information as useful as possible and as accessible as possible. And we also wanted to use this resource as a way to, uh, kind of as a one-stop shop, but essentially as a primer for access materials. So it also comes with um, quite thorough FAQs and uh, glossaries um, so that you, all, all the information pertaining to access materials in the different formats. And as I say, the different editorial contents, but also, um, you know, just the kind of more, uh, not esoteric, but more kind of overreaching ideas about the access materials. You can come, to the site with no idea about what any of that stuff, starting from the terminology downwards and hopefully get a sure footing. And you can also check things there that come up day to day that only come up once, like an obscure file format or um, there's no real, uh, the other thing is that there's no real kind of um, uh, established, especially not internationally, common uh, terminology for a lot of this stuff and a lot of the terms are used interchangeably um, mistakenly quite often and they're understood differently and so that itself can be an obstacle to access and it can be an obstacle to you know um, well obviously language is, is often an, an obstacle to kind of international collaboration in any sense um, 
So this is an attempt to allow that kind of, to bridge those those gaps. Um, I hope I've explained Sidecard uh, possibly, but it, basically it was an ongoing frustration with those missing materials, um, with people not using them, with there being an intent to make things accessible, but it falling flat due to the resources and also due to the lack of understanding. People wouldn't know what materials they held, they wouldn't know what they were for, they wouldn't know how they were useful, uh, they wouldn't know what to do with them, or, you know, one of the, the most common problems is a festival would have commissioned access materials for their festival programme and then they would just never be used again. So the films even would go on to other festivals and never be used and not be accessible. Uh, they might even go on to theatrical releases and the, those materials wouldn't be available. So we wanted to try and address that and we wanted to make it also as open as possible so that it's free to use. Um, it can be used. It can be searched, and 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 things can be logged free of charge. I think you basically you have to create an account in order to log things. Um, but it's not. There's no payment involved, and there's no registration beyond that. So you can interrogate the site without um, any kind of logging in. And all it, all it needs to happen is if you find a file that you want to use, there's details of who to contact, and then you just get in touch with them and take it from there. We also wanted to engage with international, different international approaches and standards to access materials, like um, in, in France particularly, but also generally in continental Europe. There's um, uh, there's more of a, a a tendency to charge for access materials and to relicense them. You know, once they've been paid for once, um, the copyright resides with the creator, and then if you want to use them again, there's a fee involved usually. So um, where we wanted to try and bake in as much as possible the free use of these access materials, because often cost is one of the major obstacles, um, we encouraged that. We had to build into Sidecard that it was um, that it was more flexible than that. So that's why we don't host any materials on the site itself. And we also basically allow for, if you were to contact someone who's logged the materials to ask for permission to use them and for access to the materials themselves, they can then suggest that you give them a donation or a set fee and take it from there, or they can share them freely. So we wanted to build that in, and in that sense, allow for uh, it to be useful beyond the UK, because God knows the UK has done enough to screw up otherwise. Um, is that is that enough about Sidecard, I think? Um, we also wanted to make it... Um, Slightly future-proof, like it's primarily um, populated with descriptive subtitles, also called subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, more broadly captions. Um, again, the terminology can be confusing and contradictory, um, and also audio description, but we wanted to make sure that it, it was possible that it could also um, used, be used to log things like content notes and trigger warnings and material that's, any material that's um, can be used in conjunction with film material itself. Like, you know, what, that's why Sidecar, Sidecards, it's really Sidecar database, I think is what, what we were going for. Um, anything that can be used in conjunction with the film itself um, in order to make things more accessible. So it's it's got that built in so that if, if people have, even things relating to um, autism friendly screenings, um, any, any, any of those kind of materials that can be used again and again in conjunction with the film files themselves. Um, so yeah, it was a joint initiative of us, Independent Film Office in, in the UK and a number of the regional film hubs, which as Megan said, are, are designed to um, spread the, 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 fun the funding essentially, but basically to, to make for a, a less London-centric um, film culture. Um, and so we worked with Film Hub Wales and we worked with uh, Film Hub Scotland on this as well. Um, and the idea was that it was baked in from the from the kickoff that it would be collaborative and establish a more collegial um, uh, situation for this kind of stuff. Yeah, and in terms of archives, I think we've been looking at development for Sidecard within the film sector. So we currently have quite an uptake when it comes to film festivals in the UK and distributors. So the likes of Mubi and Sovereign are listing their titles on there. Um, like I say, Matchbox holds or creates um, just infinite amounts of access material every month, it feels like at this point. So they're um, all going on there as well. But certainly if your archive is producing access materials of any sort and are interested in making sure that those are being used and future-proofed, then Sidecard is the .co.uk for you. Oh, this is like actually a really lovely picture. Um, this is... Caroline Gollum, if anyone from New York, New York, um, knows Spectacle Theatre, and we took 
um, this might horrify the archives. This is the original 16 mil um, final reel from John Paisley's private archive in Winnipeg. Um, and we took this whole hog to America from Winnipeg, stopping over in... Well, I, I should clarify that, like, the, we, we enlisted the anthology film archives to help us transport the print from Winnipeg to, to New York for these screenings. It hadn't actually been screened since the film premiered at the predecessor to the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, and so it hadn't been screened since then, and we knew it existed because of our relationship with John, so we were keen that it be screened and to take advantage of this invitation to spectacle, um, but anthology were horrified to find that it was the only print in existence that we'd brought to New York, which is quite right, we understandably, but I think we were taking more of an Henri uh, Langlois like, approach to like the, the archive there. Um, and what it resulted in is we have uh, preserved the film and it's available for, for, for screening on, in DCP and digital formats. And the, the print itself is, is still very lovely and preserved. This was the test run that was sold out just before you think we're screening to one programmer in New York. Um, so thank you for that. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, but I wanted to throw to the floor now and ask, or just get any feedback from you guys or think about how you're thinking about relationships with independent, um, bless you, programmers and your archives. Or if not, if you've never thought. No one. Give us your things. Do people within, oh, this works now. Do people in your organizations within archives, do you work with programmers? Are you screening things? Not just films, like we screen all sorts of weird fragments of things. No, everyone hates. Oh, there we go. So um, for slide card, I just wanted to clarify, on the slide it said files, do you, is it also for access prints or exhibition prints or is it all digital? So Sidecard doesn't actually hold any files. What it does is list the contact or the, if, the existence of and then contact details for whoever does have possession of those files. Um, at the moment, it's predominantly descriptive subtitles and audio description files. However, we do have the ability to list other types of um, access materials. So perhaps there would be a version of a film where there's a countdown in the corner for um, light sensitive audiences or um, yeah, we, we designed it so that basically if we, we also have DCPs listed, so if there's accessible DCPs in circulation, um, they're obviously not sidecar materials, that's inherent to the DCP itself, so we've got them listed separately, so the film title brackets DCP, so in that sense it's got the facility to upload any kind of versions of a film, um, like, you know, multiple versions. The one we also use, always use as a kind of test case was Apocalypse Now, because there's so many different varieties of that film. So, um, and that was how we kind of parsed out how best to represent those things. So it, it hopefully is um, flexible and immutable for all those, like, you know, in, in varieties of films and kinds of films. But it, it, and it's probably m most useful as a kind of exemplar uh, way that we've put that together because it is primarily for access materials for the subtitles and, and, and the audio description rather than the materials themselves. Uh, I have a question that gets at your question a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I really appreciate um, the, uh, I think in your first or second slide, the, the idea that the like found in the archives tag is, and I'm sure a lot of us appreciate that too. Um, like record reissue labels, I think have a similar thing where like that has a lot of PR pop. Um, and so I wonder, like one of the questions I have about your question is how can we work together to maybe, you know, swap that tagline out for something like equally compact that's public facing that like describes how we're collaborating in a different way. Yeah, Do you have I mean, about that? yeah, I think for us and particularly the work that we've done, um, say with Winnipeg Film Group, which has now almost become synonymous with our work or the work that we've done with Banfa is that we ensure that we are always presenting it as a collaboration with these archives. And I think that that's, um, 
the easiest way for us, one, to offer audiences context about where these films are coming from. You know, Frederick Hobbs' Troika might have been lost, but actually it was sitting in Banfa and there was a digital version of it, despite it being back to front. Um, so I think for us, it doesn't. It, it's not just about offering that context, but also making sure that we're giving credit where it's due, because we didn't find these films. We just reached out and said, oh, let's work together. Um, so I think just making sure that that collaboration is forefronted. And with the Welsh Film Archive, I think we've had this ongoing collaboration now for quite some time, and being able to present the work that the archive has been doing, even just through the way that we're framing these um, restorations now, which will now be going to a wider public in North America. I think just forefronts of the work that the archives are doing, because really we are just funneling that in some way to audiences. And also add to that, like we, it's not necessarily standard practice. There's no, um, there's no kind of norm for these things, but we always try to make sure that uh, in our listings that we thank the license holder and where this, the materials have been resourced from, um, which happens, like, uh, like vanishingly few listings actually do that. And uh, the festival is perhaps more likely, especially when there's like an actual collaboration, um, because it's often not really required to do so. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a gatekeeping thing with a lot of programmers where they don't want to let people know how they got hold of the license for a film or the film itself. And that's kind of, um, that's not, that's the opposite of what we want to do. So, and we also want, for example, our, our the Weird Weekend Festival, which we kind of touched upon, that was, that's our flagship uh, festival. And we want that increasingly to be a kind of a shop front for these kind of films, like, and, and, and to be, you know, um, uh, you know, for, for basically to feature more and more of these collaborations with, with archives and other resources um, so that's the most upstream these kind of film presentations will be, and then to facilitate further screenings, and so that it doesn't just come out of the archive and go back into the archive. And also, practically speaking, so that we don't uh, put a lot of money into a restoration and then it isn't used. Um, and we are, So we're in the business of putting those things together and keeping those uh, conversations going, and also just making sure that there's like a, a legacy for each of these screenings that kind of lasts, hopefully, for as long as possible and puts a film back into the canon, that's the other thing. These are films that kind of exist outside, usually outside the canon for whatever reason, it's not always a good reason. And so we're kind of doing, we want to do what we can to make sure that people will want to continue screening it. So, yeah. I have a comment. Um, so it's not necessarily lucrative for archives and programmers to work together. I've programmed things at Spectacle before and a spectacle is a theater that's run by a collective, uh, entirely by volunteers, and usually the programmers are working with a shoestring budget. And so it requires a lot of goodwill between the programmers and the estate, the archive that they're working with. So if you could speak more to that and the economic model. Well, we are violently rich, so that helps. No. Um... <laughs> So, so we're quite lucky that in the context that we come from within the UK, there is a framework of um, government and national funding, and certainly thanks to the BFI uh, and Screen Scotland feedback pending, um, we're able to be uh, quite active in that front. And I think that when we're talking about the collaborations with archives, we are we are very aware that what we can bring is that access to some funding. Um, and certainly we, for the for a lot of the work that we've done with the Winnipeg stuff, that has also necessitated looking at funding from different avenues, so looking at consulate funding to be able to produce descriptive subtitles in ways that wouldn't financially be viable. Um, a spectacle for us was actually great. More people came to see this film like than ever in the UK. They loved it. Um, in terms of like looking at it long term, I think the model that we're using with the Welsh Film Archive, so having that um, institutional funding from the beginning that supported X amount of activity around the translation work, the descriptive subtitles, and then moving forward with um, the North American distributor who is able to finance um, the preservation restoration and certainly um, actually we're contributing in part to some of the sound preservation in that yeah, um, and then looking forward to how that can then be used in the future to ensure that the archives are, you know, 
receiving that preservation and then being able to license that for future screenings, there's also that sort of Yeah, that collaboration. Well, to speak to the goodwill, what you're talking about a wee bit, like it's that sincerity that I think we we have to try and establish, um, and bring to what to the to the communications that we have, and that trust that needs to be established, and that's not always easily done. Um, but increasingly, you know, for example, in the conversation we had with uh, the Frederick Hobbs rights holders, like that was a conversation that took a long time before, you know, even though we'd established with Bamfa that they were keen to work with us and keen for the film to be preserved and restored and shared. Um, we then had to establish permission to even for them to release the material, so that took a while. But we were able to refer to our work with Winnipeg and with John um, to kind of establish our credentials. Um, and then it's just about um, keeping that conversation going and, and being visibly invested in, in the kind of the, the legacy of these films, so that we're not just like dumping them. I think probably a lot of these conversations happen, and then people just don't have the facility to continue them um, or to persevere or um, quite often, fi finding the right people that have the rights holders is, is, is very much going down a rabbit hole in the first place. And so that takes a lot of time and investment. And I think partly because we are a bit more fleet-footed because we are independent um, from, from institutions, there's that. And there's also, we are quite dogged in the things that we're interested in. Um, and so we are, I mean, if, the example that I referred to in terms of the, the support that the Narodny gave us to screen the uh, film called Wolf's Hole, that was the Khatalova film. And we returned to that conversation after like a year, you know, having been having been told it wasn't possible, and it, it then became possible. And so it's just patience for a lot of the time as well, patience and sincerity, and some degree of obsession. Okay. Um, thank you. That's all we have time for. Um, round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>